here we'll discuss pollutants of environmental chemists concern. So those pollutants are specifically called persistent organic pollutants. How do we classify a pollutant X? So any pollutant that we've identified, let's say in the lab, how do we identify or how do we classify that pollutant as a POP or a persistent organic pollutant? Well, the Stockholm Convention asked this question and they delivered a wonderful answer. They say that for something to be a POP, it has to meet four criteria. The first is that POP or this substance X, it needs to be toxic, okay? It has to be very toxic. And I think that kind of alludes to the pollutant part of the name. So we generally think of pollutants as being toxic to human beings. So I mean, this, uh, this particular cri criterion shouldn't seem too surprising. The second thing is that these are persistent. These pollutants are very persistent. And what I mean by persistent is that they last in the environment for a long time. And that means that their half-lives are very large. So the amount of time it takes for the concentrations to fall by a half in the environment, it's, it's a large number. It, it can take thousands of years. It can take hundreds of years sometimes. So this is what I mean by persistent. The third thing is, is that these pollutants, they're organic, right? They're organic compounds usually. Because of that, they have low molecular weights and, uh, you know, they don't, have, they don't have a lot of strong chemical interactions, uh, intramolecular, intramolecular um, interactions, or they're, they're, they're quite weak in the sense that they can evaporate easily and they can diffuse large distances and they're usually aromatic compounds so that makes them also very stable they don't degrade on their journey to wherever they're going and that's also quite problematic because then they can um, you know they can accumulate at certain points and they can travel long distances so this is probably the third part is the part that's kind of hard to remember um, so I suggest that you look over it one or two times. So they evaporate and they travel long distances. That's also a criteria that needs to be met. The fourth criterion is that they must accumulate in hydrophobic sites in the human body or in animals. Now, what I mean by that is that these pollutants, they're organic, and we know that most organic compounds, they're nonpolar. Not all of them, but some of them are. So their nonpolarness means that they can interact very well with other nonpolar objects. They can interact with polar substances. Um, and an example I'll give you is like if someone's mixed oil, it, oil and water don't mix because one is oil is nonpolar, water is polar. But oil mixes very well with other oils. Um, so that's why since most of these are nonpolar compounds, they accumulate in the fatty tissue. Um, because that's where we have, that's the fatty tissue in humans is nonpolar, it's lipids, it's mostly made out of lipids, which is a nonpolar substance. Um, and another thing is, is that the brain is non, it's, it's very, it's composed of fatty tissue, it has a high concentration of fatty tissue and lipids. So these pollutants can also accumulate in the brain and of course that can cause a lot of neurodegenerative problems, okay? So I hope you know these four criterion, remember them, and this is how you identify a POP. These will be a centerpiece to our discussion of environmental chemistry. So let's look at a few POPs. So the first one we'll look at is dioxins, or they're also called polychlorinated dibenzodioxins. So the word poly means many, chlorinated means there's a lot of chlorine atoms, dibenzo means there's two benzene rings, di meaning two, and dioxins um, is basically the building block of, of, of polychlorinated dibenzodioxins. So this name tells us about the chemical structure. So what's a dioxin? A dioxin looks like this. It's essentially a ring, right? It's an organic ring with two oxygens at the 1 and 4 position. So if something is at a 1 and 4 position like this, or the furthest it can be from one another, that's called the para position. So the position right next to this oxygen or the second position is the ortho position. 
The third position would be called the meta position, and the fourth position, since it's the furthest away from this oxygen, we call that the para position. Okay, so you might wonder, oh, five seems further. No, it really doesn't, because it if you if you start going from this direction, if you start numbering from this direction, we would see that this would be position number three. So um, number four is actually the furthest you can get. So this is um, called the para position. Now let's look at an example of. Uh, dioxin and it's TCDD trichlor tetrachloro dioxin and as we can see we have that dioxin ring which is the building block as I said then we have the two benzene rings and then we have chlorine atoms um, at various positions um, so this is a TCDD where do these come from where's the source well they're basically burning byproducts so in coal plants when they burn the coal you get this compound being released into the environment same happening with diesel trucks and so on so they're basically the result of um, burning substances well why are they so bad they're bad because they can be carcinogenic to humans they're non-polar so they can result in cancer formation um, you know if mothers are exposed to them at a at an early enough time in their gestation period, it can result in their uh, fetus um, in having a lot of mutations, and um, due to this fact, they're called teratogens. So a teratogen is something that can result in a mutation um, or a deformity in in a fetus. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with thalidomide, which was probably I think one of the first major teratogens identified and it really it was I think given to women who were pregnant and they had morning sickness so doctors prescribed them this medicine and later on they started seeing that women who would take this medicine their children would develop limb deformities so then they're like oh no this is a teratogen and we probably shouldn't prescribe it to people um that's the case with um, thalidomide I just gave you that side example so you'd understand what a teratogen is um, anyways, they can also account for a cause. Etiology just means the cause for something. So they can also be the causes of various autoimmune disorders, uh, endocrine disruptions, etc. So obviously they're not something you want to be close around. They're really bad because their half-lives, the elimination half-life from humans is about 8 to 132 years. So the amount of time it takes for the concentration of this to drop by just a half in your body it's, it's this huge number right so so let's say someone consumes about 100 milligrams or is exposed to 100 milligrams of of dioxin x right when they were two months old well just to get rid of 50 milligrams it would take them 132 years if it had this half-life Right, so you can see that it's probably it's it's a long time, and you wouldn't even excrete half of it while you were living, right? So this is why it's so bad. Um, and obviously, if you were continuously subjected to it, your body would have such a large amount that you really wouldn't get rid of any substantial amount, and that could result in a lot of bad, bad, bad issues. The third type of pollutants we'll be looking at is polychlorinated biphenyls, okay? Polychlorinated meaning there's many chlorines, biphenyl meaning there's two phenyl rings or two benzene rings. So where are they coming from? Well, they come from transformers, capacitors, adhesives, etc. Um, transformers and capacitors, if you've taken physics classes, you know a lot more about them. They're just used um, to provide electricity to people. Um, anyway, so people started identifying that these weren't too good for the environment. So in the 1970s, they were completely banned. But even if you took some sort of measuring device right now and you flung it around in the environment, you would sense that there's still concentrations, measurable concentrations of these in the environment, although we've stopped pumping them out for about 50 years now. And the reason for that is because they have huge half-lives and they're also very stable compounds they're aromatic compounds so they don't degrade easily so they're very stable um, so that's the reason why they have half-lives that are very large and that's the reason why they're still in the environment 
Now that's there's another problem that this large half-life causes and it's that they can travel to polar regions. So if they're secreted from let's say China then they can disperse away into the polar regions and start causing irreparable damage to the ozone layer. Okay, that could be an issue that they can cause, or they can start causing damage to the polar regions as well. Um, and locally, for humans, they're bad because they're also carcinogenic. They can cause cancer in humans. So let's look at an example of a PCB, and it's this PCB 118. Um, we can see those two benzene rings and then those chlorine atoms. There's many different arrangements, these benzene rings and these chlorine atoms can take. Precisely, there's a 209 different arrangements. So we call all those different forms congeners um, and we, we name them like PCB120 or PCB100, etc. So basically, we don't really give them a uh, like an exact name like we would for other chemicals we just call them PCB 118 120 I'm sure there's exact names as well but you'll see them mostly referred to in this form now let's start looking at polyaromatic hydrocarbons polyaromatic hydrocarbons are a are result of incomplete chemical combustion okay um, and I think one concerning example is for people who smoke cigarettes so when they smoke cigarettes there's incomplete combustion happening and that results in the formation of benzo alpha pyrene and this gets metabolized in your liver uh, into a diol and diol meaning there's two hyd uh, hydroxide groups that are given to this molecule and then this can attach to dna bind to it and then result in mutations so it, it's, a, it's a dangerous compound to be ingesting for sure um, and they're also caused by incomplete combustion in factories, etc. So you can inhale them just, even if you aren't a cigarette smoker, you could still inhale them in the environment. Um, so PAHs, this is their structure. I like, I like drawing benzo of a pyrene on exams just because I feel like it's a really easy structure to memorize. But you could also look at benz of anthracene and draw that as well. It's, it's, it's a relatively easy structure. I think there's three benzene rings and then the fourth one is just um, you know sticking on the side. Now the last one I want to talk to you about is DDT which is this strange looking structure over here. And I wanted to br bring that to your attention because um, this is one of the compounds that was used in pesticides for crops so it was very important for the farming and agriculture industry but now it's been banned because it has a huge 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 environmental consequence it's, it's really bad for the environment and it's also bad for humans specifically the ones who were spraying it around they would actually get cancers and ultimately die very unfortunate deaths okay so now it's been banned um not a hundred percent banned because it's very effective in killing mosquitoes especially malaria causing mosquitoes so it's still a a concern um, that's why I like bringing this to you, you know people's concern in developing countries um, it's still used and it's quite effective in killing mosquitoes that cause malaria so it's kind of a trade-off that you're doing um, but it's nonetheless very dangerous now let's look at long-range transfer of POPs now this is why they're so concerning if they're being released let's say in India or in you know in Europe or anywhere they're not just gonna be localized into that little part and the problems aren't gonna be faced by just those people over there you know from the countries that are releasing these substances not their citizens are gonna face these problems alone in fact the whole world has to bear the burden because these they're capable of long-range transport right um, if they're stable and volatile, they can spread around all over the world and cause other problems to other people um, who have nothing to even do with it, right? So they're capable of long-range transport and that is bad. Um, another way this can happen is, is that these particles, they evaporate and then they can bind to atmospheric particles called aerosols like, you know, snowflakes or or water droplets or cloud droplets um, or 
you know clouds they can bind to them and they can travel with them to other parts of the globe and this is called the grasshopper effect okay so again this is why it's so bad now how do we know how far a pollutant is going well we could look at its vapor pressure and that kind of gives us a hint if something has a very large vapor pressure it means that that substance likes to exist as a gas so it basically it's very volatile that substance won't really stay in the liquid phase for long it'll um, it will go into its vapor phase that's what a high vapor pressure means so if there's a high vapor pressure then most of the substance is in its gaseous phase and hence as a gas is able to transport all over the globe and it can accumulate in polar regions because if the globe is like you know circular then it can spread around all over and it can start accumulating in the polar regions like this okay now if you have a moderate vapor pressure that means like if something is a liquid it's gonna prefer to stay let's say 50 percent in gaseous phase and 50 percent in liquid phase so it's it's kind of volatile for these substances they're slightly vol volatile so they'll they'll just stay in the area that they were produced okay um, so they're of a local concern. Things that have a large vapor pressure, they're of a, they're of a um, global concern, right? Because everyone has to deal with that issue. But if something has a moderate vapor pressure, they're of a local concern. So if China is releasing a lot of uh, DDT, for example, which has a moderate P vapor, uh, vapor pressure, then it's going to be China's problem. But if some, some place is releasing a lot of PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls which have a high vapor pressure then it's not just going to be that region's problem it's going to be the whole world's problem because these can spread all over the globe and cause problems to all sorts of people now how do we classify something as persistent like i said pops remember i said that they have a they have a large half-life well this is how we give that half-life some numbers okay if if something can stay in air for greater than two days, that's called persistent. Um, if the half-life is two days in air, if the half-life is greater than or equal to 182 days in water, it's persistent and so on. So you can read these numbers. Um, what's the half-life? Well, this is the half-life. If something, if we graph concentration in time, okay, and we look at the, so let's say we start at 100% concentration of some substance and then let's say uh, it goes like this okay so the concentration drops and then it reaches some stable level over here now whoopsies now if you look at this point the point where the concentration drops to its 50% value and then we look at the time associated with that well that specific time is our half-life it's the it's this x value or this time value that corresponds to a reduction by 50% or half okay further um, if this 50% went to 25% then that would also be a half-life okay so this is what a half-life means i hope this video helped you um please leave some comments in this comment section if you feel like there's any improvements to be made thank